make sure you, it's going to be a, I think it's going to be a long lecture, so you should take a beer. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and the cake. Yeah, we made a completely personalized cake for, he said that's the first, so I guess it is. Uh, and our stream partner, Start Startup Hair, who provided the official stream for all, the, all of those who are watching the, the, the meetup at home. Previously, we had um, Pavel Yedrzejewski, which is kind of hard to pronounce, but yeah, he had, a, he had a lecture about building a business with open source. It was our first event in June. Later on, we had uh, Nemanja Jeklicka. He, he's a designer who spent his career in France, who really had some really interesting insights into, the, into, into his business. And it was, uh, you, uh, some of you who were here probably remember that the meetup lasted until like four in the morning. So it was, yeah. <laughs> So, uh, uh, the first two speakers, uh, our CEOs, Antonio and Marco, they brought, uh, Marco brought Nemanja, who is a designer, Antonio brought, uh, brought uh, Pavel, who is, uh, who is also somewhat specialized in, in open business, but he, when he messaged me to, to like do the research about Harry, I just googled Harry Roberts and this is what came up. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I was thinking, like, why are we bringing it here, like a criminal, or what is this? I promise you it's a different person. <laughs> oh, good. That one could be me. <laughs> but yeah, uh, see, but uh, when I did the research more thoroughly, it's, it's actually it's a legit person. <laughs> And uh, yeah, I'm completely, I'm completely opposed to speakers introducing the, themselves. So I think that that's something we need to do because they are a star of themselves. So uh, Harry used to work with um, with companies like Google, like Sky Sports, like uh, BBC. So he has a he has a really big big reference coming into here. He's he's been a speaker in more than 60 conferences so far, and I'm really eager to to hear his insight on, on, on the topic on why fast matters and how to enhance the productivity of, of, of apps and websites and yeah. Uh, just a note, make sure you follow us on our official uh, meetup.com and, and facebook.com sites and yeah, hopefully you enjoyed the lecture and make sure you tune in to the, to the rest of the things that are coming up. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, yeah so <clears throat> in England, there's a guy called Harry Roberts who killed three police officers in the 60s. <laughs> and my parents still thought it was a good idea to call me Harry Roberts. Uh, it's an old English word. The old English word Harry means to pester or annoy someone. And in Norwegian, the word Harry means uncouth or vulgar. So I had to do a talk in Norway once. And basically, uh, my name means that there's an English word, chav, right? And in fact, you'll have a lot of chavs flying in tomorrow for the football from England. <laughs> um, and that's what my name means in Norwegian, which is nice. Right then, uh, this is a really... Uh, look. There are quite a lot of slides in this talk. There are 95 slides in this talk. It's quite a long one. But what I'm going to try and do is rather than, because it's a nice small group, right? It's a nice sort of, kind of nice sized crowd. I'm going to try not to be too like preachy at you. And let's just hang out for the next sort of 45 minutes and grab a beer and some pizza afterwards. Does that sound all right? Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Right. Thank you. Uh, I need to kind of look at my slides. I've got some notes down here. If I get too quiet or walk straight in front of the projector, someone just tell me or throw something at me. Right, let's go. Um, quick show of hands. Put your hands up if you've ever used really bad conference or airport or hotel Wi-Fi before. Okay, if you put your hand up, leave your hand up, right? I know you have. Okay, so leave your hand up. There's another question. Join these people. Put your hand up as well if you've ever had to frantically look for an address for a restaurant or a meeting as you get in the back of a cab or get onto like the underground somewhere. And you're trying to get online, you're trying to like find this address before you lose connection, right? Anyone? That's happened to me as well, you have two hands up. Um, has anyone had the internet go down at work or at home and you've had to tether your phone for an afternoon and use like the mobile internet to get online, right? Leave your hands up, leave your hands up. That's nearly everyone, I'm going to keep going until everyone's hands up. Um, who's ever been abroad overseas and you've had a super expensive, super restrictive data plan, either costs 
a huge amount of money to get data, or you can't get data at all. Anyone have that? Right, so pretty much every single hand in this room went up just then. And that tells us that, I mean, we knew it already, but every single person in this room at some point has had a bad kind of performance experience that completely wasn't their fault. So I'm Harry, and I'm here to talk to you about why fast matters. That's like the 60-second version of this talk. What I find is that all developers know that performance is important, and to an extent, every manager and every client, they also know that performance is important, but no one ever tends to focus on it. Would anyone agree with that? Like, every client wants a fast website, but no client wants to pay you for a fast website, right? Never happens. So in this talk, we're going to look at some techniques, uh, some fairly fundamental techniques, to actually start convincing people why performance is important, and to actually just start building fast websites. So yeah, uh, this has already been covered. I'm Harry, I'm a developer from Leeds in the north of England. <clears throat> if anyone wants to get hold of these slides, I'm going to tweet a link to them afterwards, um, but I'll make sure it gets back to you through the meetup um, and the Facebook stuff as well, so you can grab slides. But um, I'm a consultant, so it means I spend um, a lot of different times with different companies. So it might be a couple of weeks, a couple of months with a certain company, seeing what's going wrong, seeing what's happening, and I tend to do that at scale. So I tend to work with large companies for short periods of time, helping them uh, manage UI architecture, front-end architecture, uh, mainly CSS, but a lot of the work I do is about performance. Uh, these are the kind of people I've been very, very, very lucky to work with in my career so far. And um, all of these people hire me for different things. Normally it's CSS, right? I basically, I'm a traveling clear fixed salesman, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> But a lot of these companies as well, without realizing it, have ended up needing a lot of input with performance, a lot of help making their websites and their applications fast. Either because it's already really, really slow and it was just horrible to use, or because they actually had a business objective which was to be very, very fast. And one of these companies, Trainline, this one right here, um, they did a really interesting study, a really interesting study a couple of years ago. They artificially slowed down their website by 0.3 seconds. What they found is that if they slowed down their website by 0.3 seconds, they lost 8.1 million pounds every year. So they found out that 0.3 seconds was worth 8.1 million pounds to them, just less than a third of a second. Now, I ended up helping them out on this body of work, and it's been really, really fascinating. But the good news is it's really, really, really easy to make a website 0.3 seconds faster because there's so much low-hanging fruit, and we'll look at some of that stuff during the talk. So this is a really interesting case study for me. This tells me, these are the kind of case studies that I go to new clients, and when they ask me, well, you know, why should we spend money on performance? And I say, well, because it could make you millions of pounds a year. So it can make you money, but here's an interesting one. Netflix, um, they saw a 43% decrease in their bandwidth bill just by turning on GZIP. Now the first question I've got is, who turned GZIP off? Like, why wasn't GZIP on in the first place? But the second thing is, just think about that. If you went to a restaurant and somebody said to you, hey, look, I'm going to take 43% off of your bill, you'd be like, oh, amazing. That's, that's loads of money. Now, imagine Netflix. Imagine someone cutting 43% off of a bill the size of Netflix. I hope the DevOps team, the people who implemented this change, got a very, very good pay rise because think of the amount of money that this saved them. Um, and another one, uh, GQ, fashion kind of lifestyle magazine, they cut load time by a very impressive 80%. I mean, 80% is a huge number. But they cut load times by 80%, and so an 80% increase in organic traffic. Um, of that 80%, uh, a third of people spent more time on the site. Site engagement, sorry, went up by a third. So this is what I tell to clients, because a lot of clients say, well, we're not e-commerce, so we can't make more money. And they might say things like, well, we don't have high hosting bills anyway, so we can't save any money. And it's like, well, do you want people to stay around, surely? Right? You want people to engage with the site more. And I hate to mention it, but if time on site goes up by 32%, uh, if you've got ads on that site, I know, sorry, I went there. If you've got ads on that website, you're going to make more money. You're going to make a third more ad impressions, right? So everything boils down to money. All of these case studies were very easy to get hold of. There's a site called wpostats.com. Web performance optimization, stats.com. And it's basically a treasure trove of different case studies talking about how different businesses have made or saved money 
by focusing on performance. So if you're struggling to convince a client or a product owner or anybody about the importance of performance, you can just go to this site and you can filter things by, I want to look at increased uh, revenue in e-commerce websites and give me all the case studies for that. Now I picked these three particular case studies for uh, three particular reasons. The first one showed us that performance will make us more money. The second one showed us that performance will save us money. And the third one showed us something we already knew. Performance makes users happy. We are users. We don't like slow websites. So why, why would our users like a slow website? Right? Kind of just, it's obvious stuff. But you'll notice that most of the time we focus on performance, especially in sort of the West, we always look at the financial aspect. And Part of what I want to talk about today isn't to do with financial at all. It's to do with kind of the mor morality and the ethics of performance. Because there is, I genuinely believe, an ethical reason to be fast. Right? Users can benefit from more kind of moral reasons than we can from financial ones. I've got three, I'm really not doing a good job of staying out where the slides. Uh, I've got three really particular stories I want to share with you. Um, Interesting thing about these three stories is they all happened in 2017. So I'm not talking about the internet you know, when we're using dial-up. I'm not talking about five, ten years ago. I'm talking about right now, 2017's internet. <clears throat> Friend of mine um, owns a really nice coffee shop in Leeds, in England, where I'm from. And me and him were running an event together. And he was meant to send me an email. He was meant to reply to my email about this event. And I was panicking, so I was like, dude, I need an answer. Um, so, anyway, I ended up having to go into the coffee shop and say, hey man, like, did you not see my email? And he was like, oh shit, sorry, I, I was in Thailand on holiday and the internet out there was so bad that I could see a notification. I saw a notification that I got an email, but the mobile connection was not strong enough to open it. And I wasn't sending like, you know, a 20 megabyte TIFF, I was just sending an email. And the, the connection was like strong enough to send a simple push request. Uh, sorry, a uh, simple push notification was not strong enough to even open a simple text email. The next one, this one's really interesting. I'm going to have to go right up to my computer though. Um, so I got an email from someone, and it happens quite often. I'll get emails from people asking for advice or tips and, and just um, things to do with development. So this person sent me an email, and I sent him a really long response, <clears throat> and he just didn't reply to me. Like, he didn't reply to say thank you, or didn't reply to say, oh, that's really useful. Just didn't reply, and I was like, eh, that's kind of rude, but whatever, I'll get over it. And about two weeks later, I get an email saying, hey, I'm really sorry that it took me so long to reply to you. I'm on a really bad connection. And I was like, you're forgiven as long as you tell me everything you can by bad connection. What does that mean? And he replied with this. He was like, so I'm currently at my parents' place in Rajasthan, which is in <coughs> northern India. Since my parents don't actually have a computer, they only consume internet through their smartphone. <coughs> We rely on internet services provided by telecom providers, which in our town are still 2G. Some providers claim to have 3G, but I've never actually seen that working. So, right now, I have connected my laptop via a Wi-Fi hotspot to the phone. Opening Gmail in the basic HTML version takes 30 seconds to a minute. Uh, and most of the sites, I prefer to just use my mobile anyway, rather than my laptop. And that's because Chrome seems to, uh, to work faster and consumes less data. Google optimizes a lot for slower connections, so that definitely helps. So this person was on a connection so slow. I mean, there are two really interesting things about this. One, their connection was so slow that they couldn't even open the basic version of Gmail in under 30 seconds. I've used the basic version of Gmail maybe four or five times in my entire life. And when I do, it's like, ugh, the internet is so bad, I'm going to have to use the basic version. This person has to use it all the time, and it still takes up to a minute to load. The second thing that I find really fascinating when we go to work or when we go home, we've probably got a router sat in the corner of the room that beams out a nice, sort of fast connection to us. And if we're lucky, that is backed by a fiber connection all the way back through the internet, right? This person's main entry point onto the entire internet is a 2G connection, a high latency, low bandwidth connection via a smartphone in the corner of their living room, Tin Air. They don't have a router, they've got an old Android smartphone that the entire family connects to permanently. That's not just because their internet's down, that's how people in that region consume the internet. The third story, and this is my personal favorite, again, uh, people ask me for advice quite a lot, so somebody sent me a DM on Twitter. Um, I'm not actually calling them at Harry, so I don't know who got the notification. Um, hey Harry, uh, I'm from Nepal, and um, I want to ask you some questions about coding. Can you give me some advice about writing code, and can you show me examples? 
And it just so happened, huge coincidence, about two weeks before this, I was on, uh, on my Google Analytics, and we'll come back to Google Analytics shortly. But I was on that Analytics, and it told me that Nepal was a problem region for me. My site was slow in Nepal for some reason. So I was like, hey, yeah, here's some resources, here's some resources. Um, once I have your attention, is my site slow for you? And the response was amazing. The response, this person said, no, 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 I clicked through to your website and it loads within a minute. <laughs> and that's not slow. So think about this. So two things here. One, it's my job to have a fast website. If you visit my website from Dublin, for example, it'll be fully loaded and fully rendered. It'll be complete within about 1.6 seconds. And that's when it's going slow. It's usually about 1.2, 1.3. It took a minute for someone in Nepal. The exact same website, the exact same code, CDN, everything, takes a minute. Whereas just visiting it from Europe, Northern Europe, takes less than two seconds. Now think what the internet is like for a person like this when they're visiting websites that haven't been optimized. If a very heavily optimized website takes less than a minute, what's a terribly built e-commerce site going to feel like? If a website took longer than a minute for us, we'd assume it was down and we'd just go elsewhere. We'd think, oh, well, Facebook's down. We'd go elsewhere. Whereas this person just thinks, oh wow, 58 seconds, that's a fast website. <laughs> and it made me realize that, I mean, when you start looking at sort of America and the UK and sort of, as we get further more west, we get even worse for this. But we always build the internet in this bubble of fast connections. We assume, oh, it's brilliant, yeah, yeah everyone's got 4G now, it's fine, it's fast. You know, everyone's got uh, a decent connection, everyone's got Wi-Fi. And it's completely not the case, and I'm terrible, I forget about this all the time. There's an entire hemisphere of people who have a completely different browsing experience to what we do. In fact, um, all of these stories happened in the Far East, Thailand, uh, India, and Nepal. Has anybody heard of this, the next billion users? Anybody heard of this initiative? Oh, wow. Um, cool, well, the next billion users is an initiative spearheaded by Google, which is aiming to get the next one billion people online. Currently, I think it's about 2 billion to 3 billion people in the world have the internet, and there are projected to be 1 to 2 more billion in the next 5 to 10 years coming online. If you just Google the next billion users, you'll find some really good articles. This one by the Quartz is a really good canonical resource, which will have loads of like, articles and, and case studies. But this is all about this massive, massive, huge amount of people that are still to come online. This could represent massive financial benefit for, for, well, for anyone who works on the web. Being able to build websites that load for people, uh, this next one billion people, there's a lot of money to be made there. Has anybody seen this map before, this, this graph? Yes, right, two of us. Great. This is absolutely astounding. More people live inside of that highlighted area than outside of it. The more people living under that blob than all of outside of that blob combined. Which I think is truly remarkable. And this is where that next billion users live. Pretty much all of them are in this region, the Far East. Now, when you start to think that this region covers places like uh, India, Nepal, Bangladesh, Indonesia, very, very densely populated areas, you can start to realize that, oh, okay, yeah, there probably are like more than a billion people there, definitely. So let's actually take a quick look at some of the numbers, some of the statistics that come out of this region. If we look at Bangladesh, uh, we find that the average connection is only three and a half meg. Uh, just 15% of people are online at all. Uh, 3.9 million people have a broadband connection. That only represents 2.4% of the population. I mean, 2.4% of the population are actually uh, have access to a broadband, decent, stable connection. But with 134 million cellular subscriptions, 83% of the population get online using a mobile device. Staggering numbers, vastly different. 34 times more people in Bangladesh use a late, uh, high latency, low bandwidth cellular connection for their majority of internet use. 34 times. It gets worse. If we go to India, we find that again, 3.5 meg connection, 3.5 meg average speed. This time about a quarter of people are online, and with 17.1 million broadband subscribers, that's only 1.3% of the population. Only 1.3% of the Indian population has access to what we would consider a good connection. Um, with a billion, and that's not a typo, that's one billion with a B, uh, cellular subscriptions, 
79% of the population have a mobile device that they use to get online. That's 58 times more mobile than broadband. Gets worse, go to Pakistan. The average connection here is only 2.5 megs, so it's much slower. A fifth of people are online, and with 1.8 million broadband subscribers, that's only 1%. So that number's getting even smaller. With 126 million cellular subscribers, that's 67% of the population on mobile, which means 70 times more people in Pakistan are limited to a slow, high latency, low bandwidth network for the majority of their browsing. 70 times more people. <clears throat> My favorite one uh, is Indonesia. Uh, with a 4.5 meg average connection, it's actually the fastest. It's the fastest connection out of this region. Um, again, about a fifth of people are online but only 2.8 million broadband subscribers represent 1.1% of the population with a broadband connection. This is where it gets interesting. With 338 million cellular subscriptions, that actually represent, bizarrely, 132% of the population have uh, a mobile device. What this means is people have more than one device. Does anyone here have more than one SIM kind of subscription? Yeah, me too. I've got a travel sim and I've got my regular England sim. So that's what that kind of represents. Now, the reason this is happening in Indonesia is because Southeast Asia is the biggest growing economy on the planet. But Indonesia is Southeast Asia's biggest growing country or fastest growing country. That's why their connection speeds are a little better. And that's why people have got more than one cellular subscription. That means 121 times more people in Indonesia get online with a slow mobile connection. 121 times more people. For every 121 people you line up, there's only one person that has broadband. How crazy is that? This tells us a lot about the actual infrastructure we're having, we have to develop for. So I'm just gonna quickly, these numbers are getting boring now, I get it, I'm gonna hurry up. Um, if we average things out across this entire region, three and a half meg average, 20% of people online, only 1.5% of people in that region have broadband, uh, but 90% have cellular. That means that when we build for these kind of countries, these kind of regions, we have to assume real mobile first. We have to assume high latency, low bandwidth. If we can't really build the website thinking, oh well, we'll build it on a nice fast sort of office connection and we'll just test it on a phone once every spring. That's not gonna work anymore. If we want to target these sort of regions, we have to truly build mobile first. Um, if you look at the US, for example, um, it's a bit different over there. In fact, this is, I don't know why this slides in because the US is quite impressive, uh, generally. Uh, 15 meg speeds, nearly everyone's online. Um, only a third of the US is on broadband, actually. So there are tens of millions of people in the US who don't have broadband yet. And people tend to think that because America tells us it's the greatest country in the world, it is. It turns out, actually, it turns out most, there's so many tens and tens of millions of people in the US who don't actually have a broadband subscription, they're mobile only. Um, so what does this tell us? This tells us a few things. Um, what I did actually have in here, and I've actually just got the slides the wrong way around. Um, when I post this, I'll try and get it right. I actually had Croatia in here instead of the US. And it turns out Croatia, again, we have more than 100% of mobile subscriptions. In general, Croatians have more than one kind of uh, device or one subscription. I've obviously hidden the wrong, I gave this talk last in New York, which is why I've left the America slide in and not the Croatia one. Next time I suggest you get a professional in to speak. Um, right, what does this tell us? This tells us a few things. Um, we're building for a totally different profile of user. We're building for a completely different class of person. The, the people, the users in these regions are just very different to us. And then technically we've got fundamental differences about how the network works. We have to build high latency by default, low bandwidth by default, we're dealing with a very, very different uh, kind of uh, use case entirely. So, when I go through this kind of stuff with companies, with businesses, I always get the same question. It's like, well, how fast should we be? How fast do we have? You tell me, Harry, how fast is fast enough? And really, unfortunately, there is no good answer to that question. It's impossible to answer. Uh, what you can start doing is um, taking benchmarks of where you're at right now. You can benchmark competitors. That's a really useful uh, thing to do. But you need historical data. What you need to find is, well, okay, currently it takes seven seconds to load the site, it feels slow, let's aim for five and let's go there. And when we get to five seconds, we'll reassess. Uh, it's quite a long drawn out process, but the quickest thing I always, always recommend to any company who wants to be fast is just be faster than your nearest competitor. Pick your closest competitor, find who it is that you're fighting with for money, and just be a little bit faster than them. Just start by being faster than your nearest competitor. 
Because we know from all the case studies that faster sites turn over more money, users abandon slower sites more than faster ones. If you can just be faster than your nearest competitor, immediately we have an advantage over them. There's a really great site that I found, kind of by accident, called uh, Dareboost. It's a really weird name, but it's a great application, it's a great tool. And Dareboost has this um, like performance comparison tool. And what you can do is you just put your website and a competitor's website in there, and it'll run some very, very sort of stringent, very uh, forensic tests over them. And it'll tell you which one's fastest and why and, and how that is. And you can set this up to continually measure your performance against your competitor. So you can actually get historical data. This is a really great tool. This is a great exercise to do at the beginning of a project with a client and say to them, look, we've identified that your closest competitor is so-and-so. Currently, they're 300 milliseconds faster than us. By the end of the project, I'd like to be 500 milliseconds faster than them, for example. And it gives everyone something to aim towards. It gets the client really caring about performance. And it's easy to follow the numbers. Another great tool that is unfortunately, it's quite expensive, but it is really, really good, is um, a tool called um, Speed Curve. Anyone heard of Speed Curve? Anyone used it before? So Speed Curve is fantastic. It does cost, but it's well worth it. I, I have an account uh, for my own site. And again, it takes, you can do these benchmarking comparisons. You can run tests constantly against yours and a competitor's site, and it'll give you these really digestible graphs. And business owners, like product owners, managers, clients, they love graphs like this. What I really like about Speed Curves is it's very kind of non-technical stakeholder friendly. Here we can see that The Guardian and The New York Times are fighting out, fighting out for the kind of uh, similar speeds. Uh, Huffington Post is quite a lot slower than both of them. And this kind of data we can use to say, look, we are faster than our competitor, we have been for six months, we can push things, we can add more features, we can, you know, we can afford to you know, add more stuff to the site now, and you can start budgeting this stuff. Okay, right, I want to kind of speed up a little bit. Um, how do we get there, right? So it's all well and good saying, yeah, you need to be better at performance. We need to actually get some actionable steps. We need some actual firm ways of starting to build faster websites. And people, I've got three tips to share with you. And they're not like little BuzzFeed kind of tips. They're pretty big, chunky tips that we can focus on. Um, in fact, I've already lied to you because there are, there are four tips. Um, the zeroth one is uh, just want a fast website. This sounds really cheesy, but it's amazing. When you tell this to like a, a, a client or a, a business, you actually want a fast website. No one's gonna stop you making a fast website. If you want a fast website, just, just go and build one, right? Just have a, do it, have a fast website. And people realize that it kind of is that easy. If we want a fast website and we're building a website, it's our job to make sure it's fast. So as long as you can get everyone on board um, and make sure everyone in the business agrees that yes, we want a fast website, it becomes so much easier. Do not underestimate the importance of this step. The zero step in performance optimization is intend to be fast. Once you get that bit nailed, everything else follows. Once you've made it an actual priority or a business goal, everything's easier. Once you've got someone in upper management who's bought into this stuff, everything gets easier. I was giving a talk for a company recently, an internal talk, and I kind of said this to them. I was like, look, ensure that, just make sure that the people hire want a fast website as well, and it'll happen. And it turns out their chief product officer was sat in the room during this talk, and he came up and he was like, that was amazing. Like, we needed to hear that about six months ago, unfortunately, but hearing it now is it's the next best thing. And all of a sudden now, because this one person quite high up in the business has got this idea that performance is important, that's gonna trickle down to everyone. Because normally you're fighting back up, right? It's hard to fight back up the chain. If you can get someone at the top convinced, everything gets so much easier. Okay, getting to the good stuff now, I promise. Um, understand the problem. Actually understanding what the problem is, is the biggest step into technically being faster. And when I say understand the problem, I mean like truly, properly understand the problem. Um, what can happen is you'll be in an office with a nice fast connection and you'll think, wow, this website's really fast. The bad news is that being fast on a nice brand new MacBook with a wired connection, that's not really fast. If you can be fast in the middle of a field on a cellular connection, then you're going to be fast everywhere. That's the good thing about performance optimization. If you're fast on the slowest possible connection, imagine how fast you're going to be on the fastest one. The website probably turns up before the users even ask for it. Facebook did something a few years ago. Did anybody, did anybody hear about 2G Tuesdays? Okay, a couple of us. 2G Tuesdays, really nice idea. 
Um, they kind of like, uh, Facebook got like an IP ring fence, they got an IP block and said, on a Tuesday, anyone from Facebook offices visiting the Facebook website will have that website delivered at 2G speeds. What it did is it frustrated everyone, product owners, business analysts, developers, everyone was getting super annoyed at how slow the website was. And people said to me, yeah, but we built it that slow, so you can't get annoyed. That's how slow it is for people who've got a bad connection. We did that. And all of a sudden, Facebook engineers realized, oh, wow, right, okay, we need to focus on performance because every Tuesday, this is going to be an absolute killer. <laughs> anyway, so I can't, I lack the skills to actually set up this kind of IP ring fencing, and I, I couldn't get onto the network, so I couldn't do it. I just, personally, I lack the skills to set up a 2G Tuesdays. But what I can do is use a tool called Charles. Anybody heard of or used Charles before? Oh, if, if you haven't heard of Charles, just Google Charles Proxy. It's free. And it's got this amazing setting where you can start throttling things. And you can say, right, well, I don't want to throttle my entire machine because then you can't listen to Spotify, you can't watch Netflix whilst you're working. You just want to throttle specific domains. So what you can use, you can say, right, well, my website is cswizardry.com. It uses fonts.googleapios.com. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of throttle both of those to 2G speeds. So now I can work on my machine, I can listen to Spotify, I can do email, I can do what I need to do at regular speeds, but any time I go to my own website, it feels like a 2G connection. And it allows me to truly understand what it feels like to load my website over a bad connection. You can get really granular, you can actually start putting in um, stability, reliability, so how many how much packet loss do we have. You can get really fine-grained and start to properly emulate really patchy cellular con uh, connections. This is only the start though. Unfortunately, it's not about connection speed anymore. Uh, connection speed's super important, but it's only the start of the battle. Uh, who's got a phone like this in their pocket? This is an iPhone 7. Anyone got an iPhone 7? A uh, couple of us. Anyone got like an iPhone 6? Anyone got like a fairly uh, recent Android device? Okay, so that's really good, look at it. We've got nice fast phones, we visit a site and it feels pretty fast. Um, but unfortunately, that's completely unrepresentative of the world, right? According to Google's engineers, Google's performance engineers, this is the most representative phone to test on if you want to test your site globally. Because remember, it's the World Wide Web, right? We need to test you know, global kind of. Okay, here's an interesting thing, actually. Sometimes you will literally only operate in certain regions. You might have a client who only sells things here in Split, so then this wouldn't necessarily be the best idea. But if you're a company that works even, even slightly internationally, we've got no idea who's got what phone. In fact, I was doing a talk in uh, Poland um, in, back in June, and there was a, a developer from Italy, and this was his day-to-day -day phone. Now this phone is representative, representative of emerging markets. Africa and Asia, this is a good phone to use to emulate the kind of speeds and the kind of uh, processing power that they kind of users have out there. So this is the Moto G4. Um, there's a site called Geekophone, which does really rudimentary benchmarking. Geekophone, horrible name, um, tells us that an iPhone 7 is roughly twice as fast, it's got twice as much processing power as uh, the Moto G4. For anyone who's a little more forensic, there's a site called Phone Arena, which does very, very detailed benchmarks. We can see across the board, the iPhone is three to four times faster than the most representative Android device. So that means that every time you build a site, and you, well, if you check it on your desktop machine with great CPU, it's going to feel really great. You then you test it on your iPhone or your, your new Android device, and it's going to feel, eh, it feels quite quick. You test it on the Moto G4, it's going to feel really, really bad. Has anyone seen this inside of uh, Chrome? We've got this CPU slowdown thing. People seen this? Great, yeah, spot them up. found the developers. This is a really great start. So I would recommend if you're working quickly or you're doing a quick performance audit, make sure these are turned on. Slow your CPU down by at least five times to get a rough kind of uh, phone capability CPU and throttle yourself to about a 3G connection. This is a good start, it's not perfect. Uh, Charles will actually do, so Charles Proxy tool I mentioned, will do a much better job of the network throttling. The problem with this in Chrome is that it only throttles the application layer so it doesn't introduce any artificial DNS delays, it doesn't introduce any artificial uh, TCP delays, nor will it do any packet loss, so it just makes the website feel slow. Whereas something like Charles or Network Link Conditioner, which is even, even better, Network Link Conditioner and Charles will actually give you a proper slow network uh, sort of condition, uh, packet loss, latency, etc. 
But there's no replacement for a real device. If you've got a device lab, in fact, any people have device labs at their office? Okay, good. Well, you two do. That's good. Um, maybe that's a project for it's a device lab split. Um, but if you've got a device lab, spend a bit of money and get a Moto G4 in there. I think they're about 150 euro. Um, absolutely worth it. Now, I actually, I'm a bit of a hypocrite. I don't actually have a Moto G4. I've got an even slower phone. I've got a Nexus 5 from 2013, I think. Um, this is older and slower than a G4. It still feels kind of fast. But I carry this phone everywhere with me, so I do my actual performance testing on a Moto, uh, on this Nexus 5. I was doing a performance audit for a client recently, and I realized um, they just built a brand new mobile application. They built it all in React, and it was a fully client-rendered application, and they were really happy with it because they were in an office in central London with fiber and wired connections. On very, Every developer had a, had a MacBook Pro, uh, the connection, even the Wi-Fi was great, but the wired connection was about 100 meg down. Amazing connection. So they all thought their new mobile application was really fast. Oh, it's great, it works so quickly. It's like, yeah, but you've all got iPhones and, and Macs and you're using Wi-Fi. When I plug my, uh, my uh, Nexus 5 into my laptop to profile their website, on a real 3G connection, on a real device, it took 1.78 seconds just to parse their app.js. Their main JavaScript bundle took nearly two seconds just to parse. Now this is really bad because this is divorced from network speed. Even if I'd have been on like a nice fiber Wi-Fi connection, this would have still taken nearly two seconds to parse that JavaScript because it's completely divorced from network speed. And even if the JavaScript's cached, this is just runtime overhead. Remember I mentioned Trainline at the beginning? Trainline can save uh, 8.1 million pounds by being 0.3 seconds faster. This company is throwing away two seconds just to churn over one JavaScript file. So when you start to do actual profiling, you really, really begin to understand what's going on. So build up an idea of realistic conditions, realistic processing power, realistic networking condition, uh, network conditions, and just try and fully understand how people consume your website. Any questions at this point? Cool, I'll keep going. Step two, know what's going on. There's some interesting stuff coming up here, actually. Get an overview of exactly what's happening on the website. Understand everything that's going in and out. If you ever work in a feature team, you probably work on a certain part of the site the whole time, then it goes live and you start thinking, well, hang on, what does this script do? Where does this come from? You know, do we need this? Which team introduced this? Anyone, has anyone, is this? Does this describe anyone's life as a developer? The site goes live and all of a sudden you're thinking, well, hang on. I didn't know we had tracking scripts all over the site, and someone says, oh no, marketing put those in. It's like, how? Oh, they use this, and it's like, oh right, I didn't know that. Oh, that sucks. Can we speak to marketing about that? Oh no, marketing are in a different department, you can't speak to them, or they work remotely, and it's like, what the f What on earth happened to this beautiful website that I made? What have you done to it? Now this happens all the time, especially in big companies where, like I say, teams are all over the place. So know what's going on. Uh, other people can add all sorts of things to your website. Uh, Things like tracking scripts, analytics, ad networks, all that kind of stuff that is done by non-technical people is really hard for us to audit because it's done before we can verify it. Or rather, it's done after we've finished our work. So core meetings, um, this is quite difficult because you, know, you have to make sure everyone's around. But one thing I do whenever I'm doing a performance audit with a company is I say, okay, I just want a 15 minute chat with your marketing department. And I'll say to the marketing department, which analytics do you use? Which tag manager do you use? Do you use any tracking scripts? And they'll tell me and I'll write them all down and I know then if there's a problem with this ad network, I know which meeting or which sort of department to go and speak to. So this is a very human aspect, but understand what's going on. There's a great article from a company called uh, Studio 107. It's a, a New York design agency. And there, this, um, this article is called Tags Gone Wild Managing Tag Managers. Does anyone does anyone not know what a tag manager is? I can quickly, okay. For those who don't know what a tag manager is, if your marketing department said, oh, can we just do an A-B test on these two buttons? A developer has to spend uh, maybe a morning writing a test and doing stuff, and it's just a bit laborious. And then the next day they say, okay, that's great. Can you now A-B test these two buttons? And it's like, uh, I've got proper work to do, but fine. And it's like, can you A-B test these two buttons? And it's like, oh, for f yeah. So what a tag manager does is a developer just puts one line of JavaScript in the head of the page, and that line of JavaScript then goes up and calls loads of random bits of JavaScript that the marketing team can do through a GUI. 
It's like, it's like a WYSIWYG. So a tag manager is a single small JavaScript file, which then the marketing team can inject other JavaScript files with. So you might install this single thing, like Adobe Tag Manager is a good example, Google Tag Manager is another example. These are tiny little JavaScript files that allow non-technical people, through a CMS interface, to randomly start doing things on the page. It basically is a, a free ticket for someone else who's non-technical to write JavaScript on your site. Tag managers are the devil, right? They're horrible. So this is from their article. The green stuff is the website. The green stuff is what a user wanted to see. Now inside of this green, there was one tag manager which gave the user... All of that. If, if you, I'm gonna pull this into a, look at that. There we go. This is what the user came for, and this is what we ended up giving them. This is, this is what happens when we use things like Tag Manager, because even as a developer, you can be writing the nicest code you've ever written. You can be writing super fast, lean software, and this can still happen. We need to have really candid conversations with these other departments and work out what they're using. This is horrendous. This is a, if this one user just turned JavaScript off, they would just get basically the green. And this is the kind of crap that we all are subjected to. All of us go through this, and this is because of things like tag managers. Tag managers aren't inherently evil, but they can lead to things that are pretty nasty. So this is why it's vitally important to speak to your marketing team and say, hey look, do we use any tag manager on the site? If they say no, you shake their hand and tell them thank you. If they say yes, you say, okay, which one? And then you can look into how to mitigate it. So yeah, know your liabilities. We always call them assets, right? Oh, have you got the assets for the website? They're not assets, they're liabilities. They can come around and bite you. Um, third parties can and will cripple you. So I want to show you some stuff real quick. Oh yeah, a client of mine in the UK, they use an A-B testing tool. And unfortunately, it's a client-side A-B testing tool, so what will happen is the site downloads, and a bit of JavaScript will run, it'll make the site invisible, it'll run some JavaScript, then it'll show you the website. And what happens then is it's render blocking. So part of my job was to go in and, oh, we can see here, sorry, um, this maximizer.net, this um, A-B testing tool, contributed 98% of their runtime overhead. If they'd have got rid of this, their runtime overhead would have just massively reduced. 98% of the runtime cost was from an A-B testing tool, which ironically is designed to make the website faster. Right? Um, yeah, if you want to find this stuff out, if you want to find out who's causing you the most cost, does anyone know how to get to this point? Does anyone know how to find out who is causing you problems? Part of performance engineering is just playing the blame game, finding someone whose fault it is. And when it's not your fault, that's great. Um, to get to this point, in, uh, in Chrome, in DevTools, run a performance timeline, then go to the um, summary panel, which should already be open by default, then there you need to go to bottom up and then group by domain. And what this will show you is, by domain, who is who is costing the most performance overhead. Um, if it's your domain, then it's kind of your fault. If it's another domain, it's not your fault, but then there's not much you can do about it. So kind of this horrible paradox of neither answer is good. But at least it tells us grouping by domain. Okay, do you know what? We're actually quite fast. It turns out that Typekit is the one who's slow. And as well as grouping by domain, we can group by specific URL to see which exact file is the slowest. And then in there, we can see which line number, so we can go back to a specific function, and we can say, all right, this function uh, is doing something crazy. We need to get rid of it. So anyway, this client of mine, we found out that this A-B testing tool was causing them a lot of trouble. And separately, we had a massive project to re-platform, completely rewrote their uh, entire, entire sort of uh, suite of tools and software, completely re-platformed them, and we went live without the A-B testing tool. We said to the marketing department, look, we want to go live without the A-B testing tool just so we can get a good idea of what things are looking like. Anyway, after about two weeks, uh, all key metrics were up. Um, sort of turnover, like engagement, uh, traffic was up, organic traffic, everything was going great. And what ended up happening is um, we had a first paint of 0.8 seconds, which I think for an e-commerce site is kind of a best in class. I've not seen many uh, e-commerce sites that can start painting that quickly. What ended up happening though is uh, the marketing team after about two weeks were so happy with how fast the website was, they were so happy with how much more money they were making, they said, we should put the A-B testing tool back on there so that we can really, really fine tune it and tweak things. And we said, look, the whole, the whole reason it's fast is because we got rid of this tool, right? Yeah, that's, that's why it's fast. They're like, ah, come on, put it back on. And we did, and it went from first paint at 0.8 seconds to 2.1. We added 1.3 seconds back on to the first paint to try and optimize the site, right? The irony in that is painful. 
Uh, the speed index went from 2406, which is you know, all right, to uh, 3980. All right? We uh, added 1500 milliseconds onto our speed index score. And this is all because of an optimization tool. Like, it's not optimizing, it's making it worse. And they were like, no, we need to keep it on there because we want to measure things and want to track things. It's like, well, we're measuring other things and we're telling you things are getting worse. So yeah, um, this is the kind of stuff we need to be really careful for. Uh, identifying, identifying third parties. I'm going to show you another quick screenshot from Chrome. Um, if you can get into your Chrome settings... Okay, so here's a caveat. If you've got a version of Chrome that has experiments, DevTool experiments enabled, when you open your DevTool settings, you'll find an experiments panel. Inside the experiments panel, you'll find network request group support. Like I said, I'll tweet these slides later, and if you should Google network request group support, it starts to give you some amazing insights. Because then when you go into your timeline, you can right click and you can enable a product column. So you can see there, it says product. It says product. Um, it then starts to give us this column here. Um, can anyone see that? How cool is that? So what DevTools now is telling me, hey, this JavaScript file came from Campaign Monitor. This one came from the Rubicon project. This one came from DoubleClick. So it means that when you do this performance audit, so you're sat there thinking, I've got no idea where this JavaScript is coming from. Why does this file even exist? Who's put this on the site? We can now literally see a column that says, yeah, this is where all this has come from. And it's as easy as that to start tracking back and finding out who's causing us problems. I loaded the BBC's website, and they had this crazy thing going on. This one JavaScript file here, uh, the initial TCP connection took 35 seconds. 35 seconds just to open a TCP connection. I'm not exactly sure why, maybe they were getting DDoSed, maybe they were just under heavy load. No, I've got no idea what was going on. But for some reason, 35.5 second um, TCP overhead, which was, and I don't know if you can see this, but it actually pushed the load event back to here. So the load event didn't fire until after this file had finished, so that means this file was blocking. So, um, having turned on this, um, this, this kind of product column, you can quickly see Rubicon project. Okay, I don't know what I've never heard of it. So I googled the Rubicon project. Turns out it's an ad provider. So now we're armed with enough tools to open an issue or a ticket with the ad provider and say, hey, look, every now and again you have really bad network overhead and it pushes our load times back by over half a minute. Can you please look into it? Or even better, we could say, let's stop using the ad provider. Right? Let's use someone else who's faster. But let's not use ads at all. That's never going to happen. But. So anyway. Third parties make us vulnerable. This is why it's important to understand what they are and where they're coming from. Um, I was working for Sky, a sort of broadcast company back in the UK, and um, it turns out if their tag manager, they use Adobe Tag Manager, if Adobe Tag Manager goes offline, in the worst possible scenario, there's an outage with the Tag Manager and they go down, it takes us offline for 1.3 minutes. It's a blocking script. The script itself is maybe 50 kilobytes, uh, sorry, 50 bytes. It's a tiny, tiny script, tiny, tiny script. But if it goes offline, and it's, it, their, their server's down, it takes us offline for 1.3 minutes. That's the built-in timeout that Chrome has before Chrome says, okay, keep going, 80 seconds. That means that users are looking at a blank page for 80 seconds. That means that they're gonna assume, oh, the site's down, I'll go and go somewhere else. Now, sky.com, I've got loads of competitors in England, lots of competitors for different TV services and mobile services. So if I'm thinking, well, I've just moved into a new apartment, I need to get TV set up, I could either go with BT Sports or Virgin, or I could go with Sky, and I open all three tabs, and I'm like, well, Sky's down, so I'll close that one. I end up choosing between BT or Virgin. Sky may have lost out on thousands of euro, uh, like across a lifetime of a customer, because of their desire to kind of measure things with tag managers. It makes us really vulnerable. Now, this didn't actually happen. I did this artificially when I was working with Sky to tell them, hey, look, this is how vulnerable you are. Um, this is going to be a useful slide for anyone who's um, wanting to stre stress test a website. There's a publicly available black hole server at 7266.115.13. And what this server does, it's publicly available. Any traffic that goes through that server just gets dropped on the floor, right? It's like a, it just simulates an outage. So when you're developing locally, you can point your tag manager, you can, you can point your font provider, you can point all these different services through this black hole server. And what it will do is it will locally simulate an outage on the network somewhere, and you can see how vulnerable you are. It turns out, if you're just using Google Fonts with just like link run equals style sheet, hrep is Google Fonts, if you're using that with no font loading strategy, you will also go offline for 1.3 minutes if Google Fonts is in, because CSS is a render blocking resource, it'll take you offline, it'll give a user a blank screen for 80 seconds. 
So yeah, that's really useful. Again, it's in the slides. Oh, okay, I need to hurry up. Um, so yeah, my, my kind of what I'm getting at here is don't prioritize your own metrics, your own voyeurism over your user. If your user is the person paying you, they're the most important. Lazy load your analytics, right? Take it off the critical path. If you've got a tag manager, try and do it asynchronously. Don't risk losing customers because of your own data, because your data is worthless if the user disappears, right? Oh, finally, so measure everything. That actually sounds, this sounds really, I've only just realized that saying that and then following up with measure everything sounds really hypocritical. So I'm not talking about uh, tracking scripts. I'm not talking about A-B testing. I think I'm talking about typical standard analytics. Uh, using things like web page test as well to run synthetic reports. Really important because it answers two questions. We need to know what's wrong right now. We need to know immediately what's our worst performing page. And the second thing we need to know is when is it correct? When can we stop? When have we solved this problem? I had a company get in touch with me recently. We did a, I did a performance audit for them. And um, they were like, yeah, we want to make the homepage faster and all the landing pages faster. I was like, okay, why those? And they said, well, because people come to the homepage, people come to landing pages. I was like, okay, but do you know that? And they were like, uh, we, we, we guess so. And I asked them, look, can you give me access to your Google Analytics account? Because using analytics, I can find out exactly which page is slowest in which country. Anyone have Google Analytics running on their website or their client's website? Hands up if you haven't logged into it in about six months. Yeah, yeah. Google Analytics, it's not perfect, but it's a real treasure trove of information. Has anybody looked at any of the performance stuff inside of Analytics before? Oh, good. Oh, wow. That's really good, actually. It's more than I expected. A lot of people don't even know it's there. Google Analytics has got some really good performance overview information. It will tell you this page in this country, in this city, is very slow. And it means you can optimize for very specific use cases. For example, the company I was auditing, uh, they were a travel website. And it turns out that they had um, a tour, like a golfing holiday thing that was happening in Iceland. And that page was slowest in Iceland. So it's like the, your key demographic is the one who suffered the most. Anyone from Australia visiting this is obviously hitting a correct CDN to get it nice and fast. But the people who are going to be buying this, they're the ones suffering the most. Let's not optimize the homepage. This specific golfing tour is the biggest problem. And we start to focus on the right thing. So yeah. Um, if you go to, um, this is a really long GIF. This GIF is so long that it'll start my, my machine will beach ball for a second. So I'm trying to have some beer. So I think it's um, behavior, site speed, and then page timings. Just go to there in your analytics. And you can start to dig into loads of really cool stuff. So this is how I found out Nepal was slow. It tells me on the map that Nepal is pretty bad, so you, know, you should focus on that, or rather, maybe that's a problem area. Um, so we can really begin to see geographically who suffers the most. Um, yeah, in Tanzania, sorry Tanzania, my site's bad. Um, but in the UK, it's much, much faster. This is where my machine will start beach balling. Yeah, I'm gonna keep drinking. <laughs> Uh, right, so, um, yeah, which countries are slow, which specific pages are slow, uh, we can really start to drill down into this information. Um, another interesting thing that I found is uh, Brazil. Brazil suffers. And this talk I've talked about mainly, like, you know, the Far East. It turns out that Brazil is also, to an extent, an emerging economy. Uh, interesting fact, in Brazil, in order to afford 500 megabytes of data, you have to work 8.6 hours on um, sort of standard uh, minimum wage. That means anyone on minimum wage in Brazil has to work one day a month just to pay for 500 meg of data. So an entire day is just gone to their data plan. That's really expensive. I worked out, I've got a travel sim in my phone, which I only use when I travel. So it's, it's used a fraction of the time, and I've had it for about 18 months. And I checked, and I've used 14 gig of roaming data. That means that in order for me to use 14 gig, um, data in the UK is really cheap. I'm not entirely sure what it's like in Croatia, but it's really affordable now. So for 17 pounds a month, I get unlimited data all around the world. So for me, I can use 14 gig without worry. So a person on a sort of pay-as-you-go phone in, in Brazil, they'd have to work a month, one month to afford that data. But I'm just like, oh yeah, have it all, use my data. Update Facebook over, you know, over 3G. In Brazil, they would have to literally work 28 days to pay for that data. So there's the moral aspect. 
is don't make a website that weighs 20 meg because that's genuinely, that's someone's lunch break just used up, right? Speed curves are really good then at this kind of stuff. So analytics is great for existing data, finding stuff that's already going on. It's not the best, it's got very rudimentary data. It takes averages, and this isn't very good, it takes the mean, whereas I would like to see percentiles. I'd like to see the 90th percentile has this. I would like to see the median, so, or the mode, like most users have the site loading in under five seconds. The mean isn't, isn't perfect. The speed curves obviously give you really great data. I identified a problem in Brazil on my site. I saw that Brazil was very slow. So I thought, well, okay, what could possibly be the problem in Brazil? I've got a CDN, but the nearest point of presence to Brazil is actually somewhere in Central America. So what, what can I do? Um, I implemented a few things, just way more aggressive caching, basically. And boom, all of a sudden, get this output. Now, a few things here is, if I hadn't looked at existing data, I wouldn't have known that Brazil was a problem. And if I hadn't gone back to check new data after I implemented a solution, I wouldn't know that Brazil was fixed. A lot of times I work with teams and clients who want to do performance optimization, they just think, oh, optimize images, do this, do this, do this. And they don't really know if the site ever got faster because they don't have the before and afters. So tools like analytics, which is free, speed curve's good, but it's expensive. You could use web page test instead. They will tell us if you've done a good job. I can see here that, great, I did a good job of Brazil. Um, so that one's speed curve. Um, I think it's a historical data. You can see that for a while I was over budget, but now I'm you know, starting to render in under two seconds, blah, 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 blah. The reason I like speed curve so much is it's great for non-technical stakeholders. Your manager, your client, they don't need to understand what time to first bite means. They can see that, hey, something really good happened there, right? That's all they need to know. And you can keep an eye on this, stick them on big screens, and it really, really gets the whole team invested without needing any technical knowledge. Then we can use this to start budgeting. Um, I find that non-technical people don't like the word budget, so I just say like, it's measuring, but with a, with a reason, right? So um, monitoring with alerts, get pinged if something goes wrong, um, set budgets and tolerances, you've probably all the performance budgets before, just make sure that if you can render under five seconds now, make sure it doesn't become six, make sure it always stays five or, five or under. And then really quick, we are getting towards the end now, I promise. Um, my site, it's a really basic site, um, it's got um, it's got everything a 2017 website needs. Big masthead, you know, long bands, it's, it's very, probably 2017. Um, but yeah, it's not the most complex site in the world, I think it's a fairly average looking site. Um, but it loads quite a few things, lots of different images. There are quite a lot of third parties, so I've got analytics on there, I've got a Twitter widget, I've got uh, an ad network, I've got all these kind of third party things. Um, so I just make sure that keep these things off the critical path, be aware of those liabilities. And it turns out that, yeah, my site in, this is, um, oh, I didn't say where it is. I think this is in Dublin, right? So this is the 1.28 seconds. Uh, it's rendering nice and fast. This is, yeah, this is in Ireland. It's nice and fast. It's well under budget every single day. Um, visually complete in Ireland um, is, again, well under budget. So I want to start rendering in two seconds, well under budget. I want to be fully complete in under three seconds, well under budget. But even still, if I move over to Brazil, this is the exact same website, the exact same code, the exact same CDN. Nothing is different about the website between Brazil and Ireland. But in Brazil, 50% of the time, I'm still over budget, and by quite a long way. So even optimizing the site as much as I can for a very kind of domestic network isn't good enough to get me fast in Brazil. I've still got days where I'm well over budget. And there isn't much you can do about that. Uh, here we can see I'm, I'm over budget even for the fully rendered uh, part of the time. Now, we looked at Charles Proxy really quickly. Um, now, Charles Proxy, I really recommend downloading it and experiment with it. One nice thing about Speed Curve is you can input your own custom uh, speeds. This looks a lot like the Charles Proxy interface. So what I did here is I created something called a very bad network. 10% of the packets go missing. If anyone knows anything about network infrastructure, packet loss leads to TCP slow start and uh, sort of retransmission. But TCP IP is really inefficient. It's very, it's very good for data integrity, really inefficient. So data loss, packet loss on a mobile network uh, is probably the biggest contributor to slowdowns because we've got to restart TCP transmissions, etc., etc. So I set up what I thought could be the worst possible scenario for a mobile device. And it turns out that things are really bad. There is absolutely zero continuity. There isn't even a trend here. It's erratic. So truly visiting on a, a very, very standard mobile connection to my site Visually complete is up to 10 seconds. You can soon see why people in Nepal have a bad time. 
uh, because stuff like this is just really hard to trace. If you've got monitoring and alerts, you can see at least how you're doing. But the, the whole point of a mobile network, I guess, is the uncertainty. We've got no idea what's going on once we've left our servers. Comparing that to all the other places, so Brazil's down here somewhere. Um, oh, no, sorry. Um, this is Ireland again, sorry. This is pretty cool, right? So with speed code, you can do your homepage in a country for the last one month and show start render, or you could show fully complete, or you could show all types of things. But yeah, as soon as we look at a true mobile network, absolutely, completely off the scale. And when we think about those next billion users, 90% of which are mobile users, this is what they're dealing with, and this is what we get to develop on. This is a completely, completely different world. So just to close, eventually, this is going to be like 15 minutes over. Um, so yeah, um, care, just, just care. Care about performance, optimize for performance, make sure performance is something the entire team is focusing on. Understand, uh, understand your customers, your users. Like genuinely, you might think we only do you know, cab services in Zagreb, right? There's literally no need for us to focus on uh, East Asia. That might be true now. You go and work somewhere else that might be bigger or different. It's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to affect you. So truly try and understand as much as you can about the uncertainty of our users. And then measure. Just measure everything. Measure before, measure after. Make sure you've got a really good handle on, on what's actually happening. Again, don't worry about taking pictures or anything. The slides will be available. But the statistics and data, Tim Cadleck and Tammy Everts gave me all the data in WPO stats. They built that WPO stats site. If you're interested in performance, these two are great. And then um, the stuff about network connections, that was from uh, all of these different reports, the Akamai state of the web, etc. So if you're interested in that kind of stuff, it's all out there. You just go do the kind of the, the legwork of consolidating it. But yeah, I just want to say thank you so much for your time. That was like an hour of me talking at you. So uh, thanks so much for your patience. And uh, yeah, thank you. I'm going to guess there might be a couple of questions, but I just said you've been sat here for an hour. Go and get beer and pizza and stuff, and then I'm going to be around all night. So let's hang out. If you've got any questions, uh, come and grab me. But yeah, cool. Let's go. See you.